This is Fresh Tracks Weekly. Uh, we have some exciting news in the office this week. We found out that Randy's Uncle Larry drew an elk tag in Arizona. So that's exciting for hunts that we're going to film this fall. Um, pump for Larry. The rest of us struck out in Arizona, but I'm okay with that personally. I, I had an elk tag last year, so I'll live. For me this weekend, spent a little time in the mountains. You could call it training. We went skiing uh, with my wife, Kara. It did this get slapped in the face with some sideways snow every now and then. It just kind of keeps you mentally prepared uh, for what you might encounter this hunting season. Um, but also, I just wanted this video to serve as a reminder that this weather in Montana like this is, is common. It's, it's pretty normal. I'd say probably 95% of the time there's snow this blowing sideways. Um, 20, 30 miles an hour. But I hear California is super nice. We also went on a little drive in the evening uh, looking for elk. Found a few small bulls, which was pretty cool to see. Started to see some turkeys moving around. I saw some cruising across the road. RJ, our office manager, he got some cool clips of them just cruising through town. So turkeys are moving. It's, it's getting to be that time of year and getting excited for turkey hunting this spring. In other news, Michael is on the hunt for a jet boat. I would like to be on the hunt for a jet boat, but for some reason my wife doesn't think that it's a good investment. Uh, I feel like it's a great idea. Uh, her not so much, but so naturally I'm, I'm cheering Michael along in his pursuit of finding a, a jet boat and you know promising to pay for fuel on any potential outings. Uh, so if you have a good line on a jet boat, let us know. Uh, that would be great. Uh, office lunch this week, Paul's turn to cook up something. He's making salmon, which uh, he caught in Alaska last fall. Super nice of him to share. I'm very greedy anytime that I've ever got a hold of some Alaska salmon. Uh, I hoard that stuff for myself, so thank you, Paul. Very, very kind of you to share. We're gonna jump into some headlines. So, update. Senate File 61 in Wyoming, Sage Rouse Farming Bill, that passed. So, that happened. We'll see what happens. I think they set a sunset date on it for five years. I, again, I just think it's a distraction from the real problem, but that's where we're at. Uh, update on the Vermont bills. There was those three bills that were going to be heard last week in Vermont. They are all still there in some respect, but they have changed. So there was the one banning foothold traps. There was one on banning hunting coyotes with dogs. And then um, there was one that was going to change how the Fish and Wildlife Board was made up. So SB 201, which was the ban on foothold traps, it's no longer a ban, but rather it, require, it would require trappers to follow best management practices, which is, I guess, something that most trappers currently already follow. It seems that the Vermont trappers are pretty happy with the current status of this. Senate Bill 281 has changed that if it passes, will not ban coyote hunting with hounds, but rather just create a moratorium on it. Uh, so the Fish and Wild, until the Fish and Wildlife Department creates new rules to reduce conflict between uh, hound hunters and landowners. Also, along with this, if you're going to want to hunt coyotes in Vermont, you're going to need to purchase a permit. And again, this is progressing. It hasn't passed yet. And then SB 129, which is the one that's going to change how the Fish and Wildlife Board is made up, that has been set aside for right now. Uh, so it might come back in the future. Status unknown. It's currently not prog progressing, though. In other news, 41 hunting and conservation groups signed onto a letter sent to the Fish and Wildlife Service telling them to reject any potential settlements in a pending lawsuit with the Center for Biological Diversity. So I'm going to back up and give this a little context. The Fish and Wildlife Service oversees wildlife refuges in the United States. Uh, they're public land, but they have a different mission statement um, for how they manage their land, you know, com when compared to something like the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management. So the main differences on these wildlife refuges is they're, they're managing with the primary goal of conserving wildlife and their habitats uh, and, and plant species versus uh, other federal agencies, which is more of a multi-use uh, approach where they're taking into account resource extraction and uh, more recreational opportunities and roads and all this stuff. So just to give it a little more context, wildlife refuges are just run a little differently. Refuges still manage for recreational purposes for sure, but on average the hunting and fishing opportunities are less and often more restricted than other public land. And it's not necessarily like an anti-hunting thing, like for example, certain areas will be close to fishing because they don't want people trampling waterfowl nests. But in the last four years, there's been a movement to open up hunting and fishing opportunities on wildlife refuges. And it's still done with fish and wildlife uh, conservation in mind, uh, but just allowing for more recreational opportunities 
uh, with you know thinking about different things at different times of the year. So this move to open up more public and fishing opportunities has attracted attention from groups like the Center for Biological Diversity who sued the Fish Wildlife Service over this claiming that it was going to threaten endangered species, primarily from what they're claiming from lead poisoning from lead ammunition. After that lawsuit was filed, uh, somebody caught wind of settlement talks between the Fish Wildlife Service and the Center for Biological Diversity, and it sounded like this was happening in closed doors uh, without hunters having a seat at the table. It seems like everyone, the public was being left in the dark. So this letter was sent in response to this to the Fish and Wildlife Service, urging them to reject any settlements with the Center for Bi Biological Diversity. Uh, as doing so would not align with the service's responsibilities. So it'll be interesting to follow this story. Right now it feels like the public's kind of being left in the dark, so hopefully there'll be some clarity to the situation soon. Uh, we'll continue to see what happens in Utah. A bill was also passed that allowed the State Wildlife Board to designate species that may be hunted with air rifles. Most likely this is going to follow the same species that uh, you can currently hunt with a 22 rifle in Utah. So. Uh, a lot of bird and small game species. Montana also recently adopted regulations that will allow air rifle hunting in the state for fall turkey and mountain grouse. Um, I think a lot of this is coming because uh, air rifles are getting very advanced and very popular, so people are wanting to use them for hunting purposes. From what it sounds like, it's, there are a lot of them are very similar to a 22 rifle. So that is some current regulation changes going out. But while I was researching stuff for this week, I stumbled onto an article from last year uh, and it totally clickbaited me in. It had uh, wolf attacks in the title. I mean, come on, I gotta click on that. So this article was a reference to a report that looked at all of the wolf attacks in the last 20 years. So they found out that there was 489 human victims of wolf attacks between 2002 and 2020. And of those attacks, 26 turned out to be fatal. Most of the attacks occurred with rabid wolves, it didn't say this in the report, but I would just only assume that most of the attacks occurred in Montana uh, and that Montana is full of rabid wolves, but California is not. Don't fact check me on that. I'm sure I'm not alone on this, but I tend to get bogged down in negative news from time to time. So while it's nice to stay informed about certain things, I also admit that I live my life in ignorance in reference to a lot of topics because the more I learn about stuff, the more depressing it gets often. So. I like to focus on uh, some good news every now and then. I think it's important to see all the good stories that are out there. So we're gonna focus the rest of this on some good news. There was a recent article in the Wildlife Society's uh, magazine publication titled Move It or Lose It. And it was in reference to uh, wildlife translocations using primarily the example of wood bison in Southwest Alaska where they've been absent since 1915. So one of the best examples I've seen with wildlife translocations uh, kind of an infographic map form is with bighorn sheep. The Western Association of Wildlife Agencies, or WAFWA, put together a report in 2015, so there's even been more since this report was put out, but they had a compilation of all of the different translocations over the years, and then they also had graphics showing where the movements occurred, and it was pretty cool. Just looking at Montana as an example, you can see that just what we've moved around within the state. Uh, yeah, and the crazy thing is a lot of that was source herds from an initial transplant from Alberta to Montana to Wild Horse Island that so many of these herds have grown. Nevada also has a robust record of moving desert bighorn sheep around the state. And just thinking of the example with bighorn sheep, but that we also did this with bison, we did it with elk, we did it with turkeys, we did it with mule deer, with pronghorn. There's been so many wildlife translocations over the years to bring wildlife back from what we had once lost. and. It's pretty crazy. I'd love to see a compilation uh, somehow of the spider web infographic of wildlife translocations across North America. I can't even imagine the inner, the tangled nature of that map because just looking at the bighorn sheep stuff, if you encompassed all the other species, it'd be wild. To dive a little deeper into this, we're going to get Randy and talk about some wildlife translocations that have happened over the years. Some good news. Yeah. There's some like really cool stuff that's happened over the years and is still happening with moving wildlife around yeah. uh, everywhere in the United States. Yeah, I mean, I you mean, think about it, as we've developed the landscape, the ability for wildlife to freely move back and forth and reestablish places where they've been extirpated is not like it used to be, so. Yeah, no, we, I mean, well, and it's crazy to look back. I mean, this is one of the first things I feel like they taught us in school for fish and wildlife management is 
you know, we almost depleted everything. We had everything like deer, elk, antelope, bison, mountain goats, bighorn sheep. Mm. Killed them all. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> almost. Yeah. That's the thing. We did, and, that, and that's like the big, the big kicker is almost. Yeah. But in order to get them back into their historic range, or in some cases, some ranges that they've never been before. Yeah. Uh, humans, we as managers, moved them around moved a bunch. Them back around. Yeah. I, the one I'm always proud of, Marcus, and this is my time on the board of the Elk Foundation, and this happened before I was even on the board, is in 1997, RMEF, over multiple relocations sent, I think. I can't remember. There's many hundreds of elk to Kentucky. Oh, from Montana? Is from, it a... from uh, I think, Arizona and Utah. Arizona and Utah. Okay. And uh, now Kentucky has over 10,000 elk, and they've become, if you want to call can you call it brood stock? Brood and stock. It, it's like it the, a source, like source, source population. Source population. That's okay. probably a better term. There we go. Yeah. But now we have elk in Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the only known herd that, because the CWD is allowed to be used for the movement of elk. In that east. eastern eastern half yeah. of the state, or United States. So now we have seasons in Arkansas, mm-hmm. Missouri. We've augmented the population in Michigan and in Wisconsin. All because someone said, hey, you know, there's some benefits in this relocation program. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And then even, I mean, long before that, when we nearly wiped them out the i love the old stories of there's like a bunch of pictures of loading elk onto train cars <laughs> like in montana they that, that was how the first it, um, movement happened it was out of yellowstone they'd load mm-hmm. them up into train cars and then in, onto sleighs and sleigh them out into different places it's pretty some pretty cool photos of yeah. people taking the initiative to reestablish these populations because i mean it, mm-hmm. They were all the, I mean, especially all the valleys and all the breaky country, all that stuff. We killed them all. There yeah. was nothing left. They'd been removed for competition, from livestock, for market shooters, mm-hmm. for whatever. You know, Arizona is known to have this amazing elk herd, right? Mm-hmm. The elk got put on railroad cars from captured in Yellowstone and brought to Winslow, Arizona. There were two different relocations. I think it was in the 30s. Yeah. And it was the Elks Club in Winslow, yeah, Arizona that's, that did it. That's awesome. How cool is that? Now there's, yeah. well, I'm at thousands and thousands of elk in Arizona. Well, and then like how many stories? I mean, there's so many old stories of mm-hmm. that happening all across the United States, but then we're still going. And that's like what you're referencing, you know, back east and yeah. putting elk in all those states and getting those populations built up. and. We've done it with turkeys. We put we put turkeys in Montana when we never used yeah. to have them, but now that we got agriculture, it's like, oh well, here's a niche that we can fill with the, yeah. some turkeys and then mountain goats. We put mountain goats in the mm-hmm. mountain ranges that they never used to be in. Yeah, which I I don't know how I feel about that. I think I mean I love mountain goats. They're such a yeah. cool critter. So I think I, that's a that's an interesting one. That's always the you know but, there is that question of. Should they be here? Should they not? Mm-hmm. If they, are they native? Are they not native? Uh, they might be native to the continent, but are they native to these habitats? Uh, yeah. A lot of the opportunities that we have today are because of these relocation programs. I mean, how many recent translocations or relocations have we had from Wild Horse Island? Yeah. Bighorn sheep. Bighorn in sheep. Montana that go to other states or go to yep. Montana and. Yeah, yeah, we've just been working on reestablishing our mountain ranges in Montana, yeah. which is pretty cool. Yeah, I've, we've been fortunate enough to get a film on some of those and tag yeah. along and watch the process. It's fun. Yeah, or even in the Madison Range, they've just they've been experimenting with moving them just from the southern half of the range because they're concentrating down there and moving them north and trying to get them to reestablish some of those because there's good habitat up there. And yeah. so they're just, um, but yeah, it's kind of mm-hmm. crazy how much we've moved wildlife around <laughs> yeah and utah uh i i can't remember what states but utah has had a lot of complaints from landowners of pronghorn being in the alfalfa field okay so they rather than having damage seasons they've been capturing them and relocating them around in other parts of utah and now some of the other states are saying hey we could use a few pronghorn so that's to me that's conservation at work that's hunter angler dollars license dollars right. taxes 
tangible results that you can see and hopefully ends up in people being able to enjoy that wildlife. Yeah. Well, and then there's organizations like Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. You just gave me a little sneak peek yeah. into some stuff that they, a film that they have coming out. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Then they, they contributed a lot of money towards that effort. And um, yeah. yeah, I mean, and that's a good example. You know, there's parts even of Kentucky that don't have elk. So it's not like they're taking these Kentucky elk and moving them to another state. They're moving them to other parts of Kentucky. Right, yeah, they're just kind of starting east and working their way west is what it looked like on the map to yeah. me. Moved them to, into the McCreary County. So, but, yeah. yeah. So those are just more opportunities for people to have the experience. Yeah. No, it's cool. I wish I, I was trying to research some more areas and find it. I feel like the state agencies are trying to hide it from me. I was looking at the various pages trying to figure out, because I know that there's a lot of uh, trap and transplant, essentially, mm -hmm. where you're moving those animals to other spots, and I know what's happening. Yeah. I've seen and, videos of it. But well, I, a, a cool program I've been following in Wyoming the last few years, but it's hard to find the information, is there are certain riparian areas in their high country mm -hmm. that don't have the beaver that were historically mm. there. So they have trappers who live trap nuisance beaver and they take them up into these areas where yeah. historically there had been a lot of beaver. And, you know, when we're talking about water quality, habitat quality, all these things, beaver are helpful. So you might only be moving them 40 miles. Yeah. So you state agencies, you need to do a better job of bragging <laughs> about what you're doing. Yeah, lately, and then they're only talking about the you know more controversial ones like moving wolves around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wolves. People get less problem. excited about that. Dep well, yeah. depending on who you talk to, but right. yeah, no, that's that's another one where, you know, they, for better or worse, reestablish wolves into certain yeah. locations. Or yeah. yeah, I think one point that could be made to that though is remember when we went and done these locations, how many people in our videos say, "How do I get involved?" Or right. Not? Yeah. A lot of these groups, like the Elk Foundation is looking for volunteers when they do this. Mm -hmm. uh, our friends at 2% for Conservation, Jared and those guys, they coordinate a lot of volunteer labor right. for projects like that. So it's a way for people who want to get hands dirty, boots on the ground yeah. conservation. It's cool. It's yeah. fun. Yeah, I get a hold of Jared and put you in touch with, I mean, there's... Because Wild Sheep Foundation does it for mm -hmm. bighorn sheep. You got all these different state organizations that help put these volunteer projects together. And I mean, it's there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff you can help with. Yeah, but, and it's to the benefit of all of us. So. Yeah. Some good news finally, Marcus. I, I know. I, I, I mean, I'd like to. You know, sometimes it's like you get a little down reading all these yeah. headlines and all these like, articles. But uh, I figure we need some good. We need a good news story in here. Yeah, let us know if there's some cool. Cool trap and transplant stories, wildlife in your area, can email us at weekly at freshtracks.tv.